so we are going back down into the ocean and last but not least David Carl University of Hawaii among many many other things he has been uh, providing a lot of marine scientists with opportunities by setting up and organizing and maintaining long-term uh, data um, collection and, and uh, analysis um, in the open ocean. You are very welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And your title is Station Aloha, a pro proving ground for microbial oceanography. Thank you uh, so much to the Academy and to the Crawford Foundation the committee and the uh, Crawford family, who I had a privilege uh, to meet last night at a reception. It was, uh, you know, this uh, prize is, uh, is fantastic and uh, it's international and it's a signature prize for credible fields of science, in this case, uh, microbial science. So it's, it's really a, an honor uh, to be part of this uh, wonderful symposium. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about a station I've been working at for the last 31 years, but I'll put it in a broader context of uh, microbial oceanography. First, of course, we have to honor Penny. Uh, I call it uh, Pennycoccus chisomai, is the new name for Prochlorococcus. We're going to change the name and this is when I first met Penny aboard the RV Alexander Agassi, uh, circa 1975, when she was a postdoc and I was a high school student, uh, or I was a graduate student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. She looks about the same. And this is a more recent shot with uh, uh, Giza, the uh, founding member of uh, Wu-Tan Clan, as I'm sure you all know, uh, talking with Penny about uh, putting Prochlorococcus into his next uh, rap song. These are the discussion points I'd like to touch on today, the field of microbial oceanography, which is the uh, collective field that we're studying and honoring today. I call it a sea of opportunity. I'd like to mention the critical role of time series as sentinels in the sea, and then end with some comments about our own planet, uh, the only planet we have, and um, how we've uh, imprinted on that planet, and not always in such a good way. So around uh, the 1970s, we first started using fluorescent microscopes like this one and vital dyes, in this case staining DNA, to look at microbes in a, a very small uh, microliter of seawater. And we saw this constellation of cells that Ramunas has told us about, a million cells or more if you count the viruses in every milliliter of seawater. And the question at that point was, you know, what are they doing? Uh, so this led us to a uh, consolidation of three major subdisciplines: microbiology, oceanography, and ecology. Uh, there was a subsection of those three major disciplines that created a new discipline that we now call microbial oceanography, which had a, as its major objective to figure out what the microbes were doing. Not just that they were there, but what are they doing? And there would be a new focus on the ocean habitat as the home for these microbes to study the in situ processes that microorganisms uh, conduct. Well, now we recognize that marine microorganisms do quite a few things. Uh, they control the production and consumption of organic matter. They consume and produce most of the greenhouse gases on this planet. They control nitrogen availability through this unique process of nitrogen fixation. And they especially contain this enormous genomic potential which keeps our planet moving and quite frankly keeps our planet habitable. So I, I would like to think that microbes make things happen. But when you go out to study microbes in their native habitat, the world ocean, uh, you have to make some first order decisions on where to look and what to look for. And it's remarkable how variable the world ocean is, and we've heard about this in several uh, previous presentations. Like on land where we have forests and deserts, the ocean also contains deserts, like these subtropical gyres, and forests, like the nutrient-rich high-latitude regions. 
In 1984, uh, a large-scale international program called the Joint Global Ocean Flux Study emerged as a testing ground for understanding various processes in the ocean, especially those regarding uh, major element cycles like carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and also microbial dynamics in the sea. And these were very large programs. This program lasted for 15 years. It was international in scope. It included uh, process studies at various locations around the globe, uh, modeling with data assimilation, hypothesis generation and testing, and it also included uh, time series. Now, time series are uh, something you probably never want to start and never want to stop, because once you start a time series, you, un you, you reveal the complex nature of the ocean, this time domain, that Alexander Warden was telling us about. So these are some of the criteria. You need important scientific questions because why would you spend your career uh, without them? You need an accessible site in, in the open ocean. That means you need access to the sea with uh, sustainable research vessels. You need long-term funding, which is a non-trivial matter in our, in our uh, profession. But most important, you need people. You need people to lead these programs. You need people to analyze samples and to uh, su syn synthesize the results. And I say here, you also need hope, luck, patience, determination, and you need time. Now, at my advanced age, it would be a fool's errand to start a time series program because you have to look for the 20, 30, 50 year horizon. This is the domain of all of you, the early career, and mid-career scientists. We started the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program and our Station Aloha, you've heard that in several talks, but this is the acronym for Station Aloha, a long-term oligotrophic habitat assessment because this is a station situated in the very oligotrophic, low nutrient, low biomass, North Pacific subtropical gyre essentially around the globe from here in the other ocean, the Pacific Ocean, north of the island of Oahu, uh, where I live. So our acronym is HOT. It stands for the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Program. And uh, later this month, we'll be running the 311th cruise in the series uh, since 1988. Now, the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Program, like uh, the Jagoffs program itself was focused primarily on what was called the biological pump, the biological carbon pump. And this is the summation of all of these exotic and complicated processes that go on in the epipelagic or the lighted zone of the ocean. And the export from all of these processes is a little bit of organic matter that trickles out of the euphotic zone and feeds the rest of the 90% of the global ocean and all the organisms that live there, including the deep sea benthos, as, as we heard in Warden's talk earlier. This process has major inputs and major outputs. So those were the fundamental starting points uh, of our Jagoffs program, focusing mostly on the role of solar energy. And if you want to learn more about this, you can read uh, Penny's uh, very enlightening books here. Uh, targeted for age five through adult. And you can actually learn something from these books, even if you're a professional scientist. And I learned last night at the uh, banquet that these are available on Amazon.com. Uh, so one thing I should mention about the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program, it started the same year that Penny Chisholm discovered Prochlorococcus as the most abundant plant in the ocean. Yet when we wrote the proposal to set up the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program, we said something like, well, we know everything there is to know about the ocean and its structure and its uh, food webs, and we just want to look at the time domain. Little did we know that we would have to change our entire paradigm, not only with the discovery of Prochlorococcus, but the subsequent discoveries of SAR-11, planktonic archaea, anoxygenic uh, phototrophy, proteorhodopsin phototrophy, and planktonic picoplankton-like nitrogen fixers. These were all 
discoveries that were made post uh, creation of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program. So it's a moving target in terms of our paradigm. And these are all very major achievements in the field of marine microbiology. In fact, the three major organisms that live at Station Aloha, Prochlorococcus, SAR-11, and the planktonic archaea, were not even known when we started the program in October 88. And then, of course, we've got all of this omics revolution that we've heard about in this symposium and we read about in all of the, the current journals. This has been nothing short of a revolution in our field with new genes, new organisms, and quite frankly, new research opportunities for all of you. Now, I, I'm sure you all know about the omics revolution, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the history. Uh, my reading is that it started with Sanger et al., published in Nature magazine, the, full genome, the first full, full genome sequence of any organism or let's call it a life form, as we heard earlier today. This is Phyx-174, and in the pages of Nature magazine, they printed the entire genome sequence, base pair after base pair. And you can imagine the page charges for that article. <laughs> now fast forward to 2018, and I show you just two examples of the kind of work that's being done today. Reconstruction of 2,631 metagenome assembled genomes from the global ocean. 2,631 in one scientific paper. Just think if they put the full genome sequence, how big that journal would be. And then one from Penny's lab that she already mentioned today, uh, some of the single cell genomes from Prochlorococcus and its cousin, Synecococcus, this Berube paper, Berube et al. It's a, it's a remarkable uh, benchmark in our field. <clears throat> well, to get back to the HOT program, on approximately monthly intervals, we go out to our station Aloha, 100 kilometers north of Hawaii, in very deep open ocean water, and we measure more than 50 core parameters. The list keeps growing as we uh, develop new technologies. We focus on microbial dynamics and major element cycles. We're interested in the climate impacts on microbial communities. And this will probably take, as I said, 30, 40, 50 years. And all of our data are publicly available at this website. And as I mentioned, we're up to 311 cruises. Uh, this is a atypical site at Station Aloha. Uh, when Balboa crossed the isthmus, he saw this very calm ocean, called it the Pacific Ocean. But this is the reality of most of the time we're out at Station Aloha. It's a very difficult and challenging environment uh, to work in. These are some of the major achievements. We've got this 30-year-plus and growing climatology on hydrography and export and production and various microbial dynamics. We have uh, a very large and growing uh, metagenome, transcriptome, and gene catalog, annotated gene catalog, and I'll mention that in a minute. And we've got, more importantly, new views on microbial life in the ocean. And the Aloha Curve. Uh, this Aloha Curve, most of you know the Keeling Curve. This is the manifestation of the human imprint on our planet. This is the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration on the top of Mauna Loa Observatory on the island of Hawaii, where Keeling has been making this measurement, or Keeling's colleagues, because Keeling is no longer with us. He started this program in 1957, and without this time series, we wouldn't have any understanding of the beat of this planet with regard to the human imprint. This is probably one of the most important uh, data sets in Earth sciences along with ice core data going back into uh, very ancient times and reconstructing uh, paleoclimates and paleoenvironments. Well, here's the data from Station Aloha, and you can see that the rise in carbon dioxide in the surface ocean is in parallel with the rise in the atmosphere. The two liquid environments on Earth, the atmosphere and the ocean, are in beach frequency, and this absorption of CO2 into the surface ocean causes an acidification because of the formation of carbonic acid. And you can actually see the ocean becoming 
more acidic, and that was reported from observations for the first time in this uh, PNAS paper, which was awarded the Cozzarelli Prize for the best paper of the previous year. So it was a, a pretty important, we think, uh, discovery from our station. I mentioned uh, the Aloha Microbiome. This is a paper published uh, by Daniel Mende from Ed DeLong's lab and a number of co uh, collaborators. This is uh, seven depths in the water column down to 1,000 meters with 9 million non-redundant assembled and fully annotated genes. And this is a catalog that's publicly available uh, for your uh, observation and research pleasure. I should say that the aggregate research at Station Aloha has led to more than 1,000 peer-reviewed scientific publications, 60 of which were reproduced uh, just in the current issue of the uh, Limnology and Oceanography Bulletin. This is a, a, a uh, virtual issue. You can go to the web and download these 60 papers and you'll get a good cross-section of the type of research that is being done and has been done at Station Aloha. And we wrote a little introduction to that, Matt Church, my colleague and I. Uh, we call this a gathering place for discovery, education, and s scientific collaboration because most of the work being done there is collaborative with scientists, uh, students, and prof professionals from around the world. Now, this is the joy of time series. Uh, for the first decade, you, you're getting going. It's not a joy at all. You wonder why you're doing this, and you start to get some sense of, of the lessons learned in creating uh, a, a program that you'll need to sustain over time. Then uh, after 10 years, let's say between 10 and 25, you, you start seeing some interesting data sets. So it becomes more valuable and more defendable to the funding agencies and, and more rewarding to yourself as a, as a scientist. And then after 25 years or so, I say that it's, it's beyond observations. This is where the rubber hits the road. This is where it gets really exciting because you can start generating important ecological hypotheses. You can test those with experimentation. You can develop predictive models. So I would like to think that HOT has reached middle age we are beyond observations, and on August 1st of, of this year, a couple months from now, I will be turning the program over to the next uh, generation, to a mid-career scientist who hopefully uh, can keep it funded and vital for the next 30 years or so. Now, one of the things... Uh, thank you. <laughs> one of the things that we've been doing... Uh, beyond observation, is to try to understand the flux of organic matter as a function of depth. And what's shown here is a profile of the carbon flux versus depth over the top 2,000 meters of the water column. And you can see that you have a very large flux coming out of the euphotic zone. That's the starting material for the whole rest of the water column and the sediments below. But with depth, you see a very rapid attrition of that material through a combined processes of microbial degradation, disaggregation, and a number of other processes, consumption. And we would like to understand what forms the shape of that curve. And that curve has been fit to these mathematical equations and this factor minus b, the, the coefficient, is, is called the attrition coefficient. And each environment has a slightly different attrition coefficient. But for the subtropical gyre, we now know that this is pretty well constrained, fitting this equation with the coefficient minus 0.8 to minus 0.9. And it really doesn't change that much. But this is for carbon flux. Organisms don't necessarily live by carbon. They need energy. So, of course, carbon is one form of energy, but only one form. And not all carbon is equally valuable in terms of its energetic content. We know that carbon has various oxidation states. So, uh, 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 oxidized uh, acid, a carboxylic acid, for example, doesn't contain as much energy as methane does. So, we would like to find out the energetics of this system. And that's really never been done before. So, a 
two weeks ago, we published this paper in Nature Communications, which is the first ever report of the energy flux in the ocean uh, to go along with the carbon flux. And this is our word cloud from the paper, suspended per or sinking particulate material and energy. Those are the two themes of this paper. And these are a few of the data in, those, in that paper. And this is the flux of energy as a function of depth. You can see that it can be fit with the same power functions as carbon, but the coefficient is much steeper. In other words, energy is lost much more rapidly from the sinking material than carbon is. And when you get down to 500 meters, you have a carbon material that has only about 20% of the energy content as a material that left the euphotic zone. And it might not even be able to sustain further microbial degradation because of its oxidation state. Now, one of the things about studying the ocean is that you can look at the ocean in two fundamentally different viewpoints. And they're both named after mathematicians who developed the theoretical frames of reference for those viewpoints. One is called the Eulerian viewpoint, and that's when you stand in a single location and look at phenomena as they go by. That's the structure of Station Aloha. It's a geolocated station in the subtropical gyre. And we don't look as the currents go by, we just stand there and look at what's given to us. The alternative is the Lagrangian way of looking at things, where you actually trace a water mass with a drifter or a float. And we have been doing both of these frames of reference. And this shows uh, an example of a Lagrangian float that we deployed in an anticyclonic gyre near Station Aloha. And we followed it in this path over a period of about 14 days and sampled along the way. And this is the only frame of reference that you could use to uncover diol processes in the ocean, those that happen on daily timescales. And we've done that, and we recently published it in a, in a paper in Nature Microbiology. I won't dwell on this, but this is one of the first papers where we actually looked at the transcriptome, what genes were being transcribed, as well as looking at the phenomena, the physiological phenomena, the ecological phenomena in that same water column. So, for example, in this shaded blue, this is a transcription of, a, of a, uh, one of the proteins that's used in cell division of this organism, Crocosphera, and then this is the actual cell numbers showing the point of cell division. So the protein uh, synthesis precedes the cell division. Same down here, these are uh, NIF gene transcripts, and the lines are the rate of nitrogen fixation measured from N15 incubations. We have also been using novel technologies at Station Aloha. This is an article from The Economist. 20,000 colleagues under the sea that take on Jules Verne's uh, leagues under the sea. And this is using robots to help resolve this complex time-space continuum. And we've been using robots that allow you to do what I call environmental sequencing. A, T, G, and C. Uh, these are different Acronyms, A, absorption of DOM, T, temperature, G, gas for oxygen, and C, for chlorophyll. But the analog of doing sequence analysis, this would be the metabolic analog. And we have shown that even in the subtropical gyre, with optodes on these robots, we can resolve a diol cycle in the net oxygen production during photosynthesis and the net oxygen cons consumption at night during respiration. And you can fit it to these very nice curves that actually Howard and Eugene Odom did in the 1950s. And I know Odom was a previous recipient of the Crawford Prize for his work on respiration and photosynthesis. We have put these optodes now for long-term duration uh, missions in the subtropical gyre where we can look day after day at the production and respiration. And much to our surprise, we found that day after day or day by day analysis shows very high uh, variability, which we didn't really predict for the subtropical gyre. So this will be very exciting over the next decade to figure out what's feeding this variability in an otherwise very stable environment. 
Now, one of the challenges, there are many challenges of time series, but one of the challenges is looking at a single ecosystem that is undergoing environmental change through climate variability. And we know that the oceans are changing, they're becoming uh, warmer, they're becoming more acidic, we're losing biodiversity, and they're becoming polluted with nutrients at many levels. Now, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, Assessment Report 5, which I was part of, wrote an ocean systems chapter where we summarized the state of the ocean uh, circa 19, or 2014 when this was published. Ocean ecosystems have responded and will continue to respond to climate change at different rates, magnitudes, durations, and this is one of these statements in the IPCC report that is virtually certain. Uh, with changes in the ocean warming, we will get a migration and expansion of the subtropical gyres, which uh, Penny mentioned, with Prochlorococcus marching northward and southward from its current uh, habitat restriction in temperature, and the whole ocean will become ultimately more phosphorus limited. And this is something we've been tracking over time. So what will it take in all of this? Well, we think observations are key, but there will also need to be experiments and theory and modeling. And modeling is super important. We haven't heard much about modeling of microbial ecosystems yet, but there was a, a distinguished uh, American Academy report about incorporating microbial processes into climate models. And this is something that's the report says it's daunting, uh, but it is perhaps within reach. And, but the, you have to th remember that microbes vary from genomic information all the way up to the entire ocean basin scale, the biome. So this is a huge challenge. At the genomic level, uh, my lab, John Casey, one of my former students, uh, in a collaboration with Jens Nielsen at Chalmers University here in Sweden, uh, published the first ever uh, genome scale metabolic network model for Prochlorococcus. We use the MED4 ecotype, and this is a fully mass charged, thermodynamically balanced uh, model that's available. And we applied that model to Prochlorococcus a phosphorus stressed phenotype. And we were particularly interested in testing the possibility that Prochlorococcus might be involved in the reduction and or oxidation of phosphorus. And this is a whole metabolic process that has only recently been discovered in the biosphere. Now, in a pioneering paper that came from Ed DeLong and Penny Chisholm's lab a few years ago, they showed that Prochlorococcus strain 9301 could actually grow on reduced phosphorus in the form of phosphite. And I was wondering whether the oxidation of phosphite might be able to uh, conserve some of that energy of oxidation and use that as a growth enhancement. But they did no uh, energetic analysis, so we became very interested in this similar problem. We used 90 301 strain as well, and we recently were able to show growth not only on phosphite, but also on methylphosphonate, which is a very unusual carbon phosphorid bonded compound that we now know is very common in the marine environment. And we used some C14 labeled methylphosphonate to track the metabolism of this compound, and we found out that it only labeled purine bases in both RNA and DNA. So from that analysis, we were able to reconstruct a hypothetical oxidation pathway, which will appear in, in the journal Applied in Environmental Microbiology uh, in, uh, in a couple weeks. We just got the proofs actually last night. This is Oscar Sosa's work. And now we know the pathway and we know the presumed genes involved, so we can go back to the environment and look at the gene surveys from the Terra expedition and other major ocean surveys, and we find out that these genes are located in these phosphorus-limited habitats, especially the North Pacific, uh, North Atlantic subtropical gyre. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are in this together. Science, society, and sustainability are inextricably linked. This is really 
the larger context of our work and what really matters. And we believe that the work we're doing at Station Aloha and the work writ large within the field of microbial oceanography fits in this so-called Pasteur's Quadrant. This is a wonderful book if you haven't seen it by uh, Donald Stokes. He talks about the role of basic and applied sciences, that there's a continuum, there's no separation. Of course, Niels Bohr did this pure science, and Thomas Edison did this pure applied science. But Pasteur, the giant of microbiology, was really an applied basic scientist. And we feel that the work we're doing can improve models, inform society, and help protect the sea. And in that context, in the next issue of Nature Review Microbiology, there will be a uh, commentary called The Scientist's Warning to Humanity, Microorganisms and Climate Change. So please look out for this. It's part of a growing alliance of world scientists warning, uh, warning about the fragility of our ecosystems on land as well as in the sea. And as Pasteur says, the very great is achieved by the very small. So ladies and gentlemen, in closing, this is really what's at stake. A conceptual understanding of uh, the sea, Earth's largest biome, global productivity, carbon sequestration, planetary habitability, and probably our own uh, survival. So I would say quite a bit is at stake. And with that, I'd like to thank the people who fund our work, in particular, uh, the National Science Foundation that funds the Hawaii Ocean Time Series and the Simons Foundation, which funds the uh, Simons Collaboration on Ocean Processes and Ecology. And rather than saying the end, I say we are celebrating microbial ecology. This is not the end, it's just the beginning. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Dave, for a fantastic presentation. I'm sure there are questions. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Dave. That was awesome. And also, thanks for your dedication for, uh, for making this time series so, uh, so effective over the years. My question is actually very simple. I noticed that the, that the CO2 content in the atmosphere and the oceans uh, uh, were anti-sympathetic in their, in their form. Well, why is that? Yeah, that's a very good question. There's also, you probably, I thought you were going to say, well, gee, you guys can't measure CO2 as well as keeling because your, your, uh, <clears throat> you know, your variability is so high, but that's because the ocean is a very different uh, fluid than the atmosphere. It's, it's a lot more heterogeneous, so that explains the, the spikes in our data sets. Now, the antithesis is because the ocean uh, CO2 balance is primarily a temperature-driven phenomenon. So a cold ocean water will absorb more CO2, whereas in the atmosphere you generate all the CO2 in the uh, early fall when the temperatures are warm because that's when the de deciduous uh, forests are, are decaying by these great uh, fungi that we just heard about. So that there is a, a difference in the timing, but the, uh, <clears throat> the trend lines are, are uh, indisputable. Torin. So, thank you for an inspiring talk. Do you know if your time series and the success of the time series has has stimulated or or served as a good example for other time series and doing more monitoring of of all sorts of environmental data, also lakes and and other seas? Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful question. I, w I would like to think it did, but I should say that the time series uh, ecological science goes way back. Uh, there are time series that started in the late 1800s, and, and uh, this uh, Lake Mendota work and, and uh, 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 lakes in, in uh, Wisconsin, they've been looking at the ice uh, going out of Lake Mendota for over 100 years, and that has given us this great time series to show the effect of a, of a warmer uh, northern hemisphere. And yes, so I would like to think that our program, uh, we started two programs within the JGOS uh, uh, 
program, uh, the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series, the BATS program, which you heard about, and the HOT program got started on the same day in the same year of the same month, uh, October 30th, 1988 is the birthday of both of those sites. So we coordinated those, we wrote the proposals together, and subsequently uh, time series were created by the Japanese, I know, and that's still ongoing, uh, by the uh, Taiwanese in the South China Sea. Uh, there was already a, a French and a, a Canaries Island program going. So we are a consortium of time series, and there's a lot of coastal time series that uh, have sprung up as a result. And your point about monitoring is a very good one. When, when we started this program and when I was in graduate school, you never mentioned monitoring in a proposal. It was a bad word, the M word. And uh, I remember Keeling, uh, uh, I took courses from Dave Keeling, and he lamented the fact that he could never get his uh, time series funded, if you can believe that, one of the most important time series records uh, of all. And he had, he had struggled every couple years to, to get that refunded. And he wrote a, a nice uh, biographical in uh, annual review of, of uh, I think it was Earth and Planetary Science, uh, where he talked about rewards and penalties for monitoring the Earth. That was the title of, the, of his uh, hmm. chapter. And it was, it's just, it's, it's a remarkable read if you're interested in, in time series. All the uh, struggles, but all the rewards. So thank you for that question. One more? Yeah, Dave. The, uh, I have to ask this question. As, as you probably know, I spent the last 25 years of my life working on something called the Global Ocean Observing System, of which, of course, time series is really important. And my question is, and this relates to what students might be thinking about doing in their careers, is how do you see the relationship between research and operational oceanography evolving? Yeah, well, that's a very good question. There's, uh, as you know, uh, Tom and others in the room, we now have developed some very sophisticated uh, engineering uh, advances for monitoring certain things in the ocean. Uh, when I say certain things, it's uh, core principles like temperature and, and uh, salinity, oxygen, uh, but we still can't do uh, ecology and we can't do uh, sample return very easily. So I think there will be some great progress made in engineering advances that will allow us to either bring more sophisticated tools into the ocean, like real-time sequencing or, or uh, ability to conduct experiments um, without uh, human intervention. Uh, you could imagine robots going across the ocean doing uh, incubation experiments and reporting out on uh, uptake of tracers or or even uh, stable isotope probing, who knows what. I mean, the, if you look at the advances that have been made uh, in the digital era and in the computational era, uh, when I started as a young professor, I, I didn't own a computer. There, were, there was only one computer in our entire university, I think, and, and it was the so-called mainframe that you could maybe do some word processing on. But it was, uh, you know, the things have changed so quickly and uh, to our benefits, I think. But we have to be careful not to assume that technology can do all the uh, things that we would be doing as experimental scientists because I don't think that is ever going to be the case. We need uh, people doing careful in-lab and in-ocean experiments. We need uh, careful uh, cellular biology being done and, and uh, microscopy that we heard from Rachel earlier today, these are things that I don't think we'll ever uh, get replacements for, for the human doing those sorts of things. So thank you for that question. We might be able to debate this over uh, dinner because it's a very important question. How far will technology take us uh, versus the, you know, uh, the human? I, I don't think we'll have autonomous laboratories like they're talking about autonomous cars and things like that. I don't think we'll get rid of professors at least I hope not in my lifetime, until uh, <laughs> I retire. Yeah. Dave, can I make one, one comment in that regard? Because where, where I was kind of coming from there is, I think right now the biggest, I'm looking at the, like the relationship between the Weather Service and meteorology, in terms of operation, o, o, operational oceanography and research. 
And the biggest hurdle right now to actually establishing is not technology, is we don't have the labor force out there to do it. Yeah, it's a very good yeah. point. And that leads to the education and training mission of all of us. And um, maybe people need to be trained differently in the future as they've been trained in the past. And in a previous life, I was a high school teacher at a vocational school. And the vocational schools were for the kids that really didn't want to read the books. They wanted to do something with their life, uh, auto mechanics or electrical, uh, you know, become a plumber or an electrician. And I don't know if we even have vocational schools anymore in the United States like that, but maybe we need to return to people that can be trained to do uh, vocations that will be uh, in need in, in the future. So thank you very much for that discussion. Thank you very much. Um, we are running a bit late, and I think we should wrap up. Thanks a lot, Dave. I think... <clears throat> I think many agree with me that this has been just an amazing day with the presentations we have had, archaea and cyanobacteria and bacteria and fungi and uh, I forgot something, I think, eukaryotes and protists and everything from genomics and microscopy to uh, uh, open ocean sampling videos with big waves uh, and, and uh, <laughs> micrographs with uh, tiny organelles. <laughs> Uh, so this, I think, has been amazing. And, and we had a range of speakers, different career stages, all really high-level scientists. Thanks a lot to all those speakers, and thanks a lot to everyone who came here to attend and contribute with questions and support. So uh, thanks a lot. Thank you.